And then uh, there was a moment in time when you actually left the country in the 90s to go live in Asia. Yeah, so, you know, after Internex, um, I, I, I did some stuff with uh, security for a while, um, and then uh, there was an opportunity to go out and build data centers in Asia. And, um, you know, I, I mean, at that time, you know, I really saw myself as an engineer dude. You know, I had bleached blonde hair. I wore big baggy jeans. I wore these heavy metal t-shirts. I had this long chain to my wallet. Uh, I was very, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't worry too much about anything except just doing my engineering stuff. And then what happened was, um, you know, I built the security team there. I launched a couple of security products for us, a intrusion a vulnerability scanning service and a managed firewall service. And then, um, you know, the exec team basically came to me and they said, look, we need you to go to Asia and run, you know, our professional services team across Asia. And I was like, no, there's no way. Because I knew, like, I'd have to wear, like, a collared shirt and, you know, <laughs> I, I'd have to dress in business casual clothing, which is all stuff that I didn't want to do. They probably um, saw in you the, this notion that, you were just rolling your sleeves up and you could just go in and, and, and just yeah, get stuff done. Yeah, I got done. shit done. Yeah, yeah. I got shit done. Yeah. So what happened was um, my best friend who had brought me in, you know, came to me, uh, Adam Waters, who was later my co-founder at CloudScale, and he was like, dude, you just got to do this. You just got to level up. And so I just thought about it and I was like, you know what? You're right. Like I've almost never done I, almost every job I've ever had I've been in over my head and it's just worked well for me because then I'm challenged and I can level up and I said you know this is a different challenge it's more on the business side on the leadership side uh, it's not engineering as much but you know I've done tons of consulting I know what I'm doing this is this is doable um, and I've been going to Hong Kong because that's where the headquarters was for you know about six to nine months, I had some idea. And I was like, you know, I haven't ever done this thing of like living and working overseas. I've just traveled uh, for, for um, fun. So screw it, I'll just do it. So I got rid of the blonde hair. <laughs> I went out, <laughs> I got myself some suits and business casual clothing, um, taught myself how to tie a tie, <laughs> all that stuff. And I uh, moved to Hong Kong and, you know, uh, ran my team there across Asia Pac. There was about 20 to 25 folks, uh, mostly in Hong Kong, Taipei, and uh, Korea, uh, many of whom I still keep in touch with. And, um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a great experience. Uh, you know, it was just a bummer because our timing wasn't great. You know, we did our IPO and everything, but that was at the time of the dot-com bomb, dot-bomb. And, um, you know, we were focused on – you know, the business model was really predicated on selling about 25% wholesale space to um, telecommunications providers, and they were all taking a massive hit at that point. So, and yeah, so it didn't, didn't that one didn't end well, but, uh, but it was a fun ride. I mean, when I started at IASIA Works, um, it was 80 people, and when it ended about a year and a half, two years later, it was 420 people because we acquired AT&T's Hong Kong business, um, you know, and did a bunch of acquisitions across the region and hired like mad. So again, you know, like a 5X growth in employees in a year and a half, two years time. I mean, that's just, that's nutty. And, and what, was, uh, what was distinct about, you know, Taiwanese, Hong Kong, Asian culture working there? for you uh, well i mean the one thing that was great was like the level of hustle you know that was pretty amazing another thing that i really enjoyed was um there was a there was a way to connect with people where you had very little common you know basic language but you could speak in technical languages and diagrams and completely connect so the the best router jock we had was a guy out of korea and he was just a badass network engineer um but he spoke no english but we could get on the whiteboard with him and we could diagram out the networks and all this stuff and he just was really good just he knew he understood everything we were saying he made a lot of corrections and gave us you know feedback on how to you know make the network better 
Um, and so that was really enjoyable, right? There was this whole way to connect that was just the language of technology. It had nothing to do with like the spoken language at all, other than, you know, some lingo terms. Um, so those are those are both really positive. And I think just, you know, living in another culture was really good for me. Um, you know, I had my times where I had to sort of like learn some humility because, you know, the way that you would do it in America wasn't going to work there. Uh, and then I also had some times where, um, you know, bringing some of kind of the American attitude was was really helpful for, I think, some of the folks who, who worked for me. Um, and uh, and I think it was really interesting to bring a different management style too, because uh, a lot of what happens in Asia is things are based off of seniority. And so you don't get really that whole get shit done, that startup attitude of like, you get rewarded for, 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 for doing things. They didn't really understand that until I started elevating people and making, putting them in charge that, and they might not be senior, but they were the ones who were making the changes and getting shit done. So. Of course, I put them more, I gave them more uh, stuff to do and elevated them and promoted them. And I think uh, it even, you know, there were some people who resented me for doing that. And, but I just, I just didn't care because like, I'm not, I'm not there to build, you know, an Asian based ISP. I'm there to bring sort of American techniques, not just to the data center, but also in the culture to the way that we built the company. And um, so that was good. Um, it's no, an interesting I mean, platform. It's an interesting platform for your future open source life, because, in a in a sense, even though they may a lot of them do speak English, like the spoken English, but there's many different, uh, I guess, personalities and fiefdoms you're uniting in open source life, which we'll get to later. So sure. I, I I bet there was some implicit learnings here. Yeah. Yeah, and you know the, I mean, there are some similarities um, between um, uh, different Asian cultures, but there's also some pretty, pretty key differences between like you know South Koreans and Taiwanese and, and Hong Kong Chinese, um, and you know we also had um, folks in Singapore and in Japan and in Australia, so those were even different cultures, and in some cases, you know, it was like uh, an Aussie or uh, I think Lawrence is actually English, Lawrence Field. He's English and he's a English expat who'd been living in Japan and married to a Japanese woman for, for forever. So he spoke Japanese and understood that culture. And, and so I had a, you know, expat reporting to me from Japan. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a pretty big, it was a pretty different mix of personalities. 